Crown Never Sleeps podcast. I'm your host, Larry Elise. Today we're diving into the life and crimes of one of the most infamous mobsters in modern history, James Whitey Bolger. But first, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Pondex, for sponsoring this episode. If you're looking for a way to grow your audience and reach more engagement, you're going to want to check out Pondex today. Go to pondex.com, and if you use the promo code Larry21, you can save 10% off your order. We'd also like to thank Audible. If you want a free 30-day trial with a free audiobook of your choice, which you can keep even if you cancel your trial, go to audibletrial.com slash Larry21. And of course, you can always be a part of the show by sending us a voicemail at 682-305-0483. Let us know your thoughts on the topic of the day or let us know other crimes you want us to cover. But moving on, we dive into today's topic, Whitey Bulger. Bulger's father, James Joseph Bulger Sr., was from Harbor Grace, Newfoundland, Newfoundland, now the Canadian province of Newfoundland and Labrador, hailing from Irish parents. After settling in Everett, Massachusetts, James Sr. married Jane Veronica McCarthy, a first-generation Irish immigrant. Their first child, James Joseph Bulger Jr., was born in 1929. Bulger's father worked as a union laborer and occasional longshoreman. He lost his arm in an industrial accident, and the family was reduced to poverty. In May 1938, the Mary Ellen McCormick Housing Project was opened in the neighborhood of South Boston. The Bulger family moved in, and the children grew up there. The other Bulger children, William and John, excelled at school. James Bulger Jr. became drawn into street life. Early in his criminal career, local police gave Bulger the nickname Whitey because of his blonde hair. Bulger hated the name. He preferred to be called Jim, Jimmy, or even Boots. The last nickname came from his habit of wearing cowboy boots. However, the nickname Whitey stuck. Bulger developed a reputation as a thief and street fighter fiercely loyal to South Boston. This led him to this led to him meeting more experienced criminals and finding more lucrative opportunities. In 1943, 14-year-old Bulger was arrested and charged with larceny. By then, he had joined a street gang known as the Shamrocks and would eventually be arrested for assault, forgery, and armed robbery. Bulger was sentenced to a juvenile reformatory for these crimes. Shortly after his release, in April 1948, Bulger joined the U.S. Air Force, but he had not reformed. He spent time in a military prison for several assaults and was later arrested by Air Force police in 1950 for going AWOL. Nevertheless, he received an honorable discharge in 1952 and returned to Massachusetts. Now, before we dive into his prison experience, we'd like to remind you to hit that subscribe button and hit the bell notification button to be notified of future videos. Also, leave a comment in the comment section below. Give us your thoughts on Whitey Bulger and any other comments you have about the topic we covered today. Is there something we missed, something we got wrong? Let us know in the comment section below. In 1956, Bulger served his first term in federal prison in Atlanta Penitentiary for armed robbery and truck hijacking. He later told mobster Kevin Weeks that while there, he was used as a human subject in the CIA-sponsored MK Ultra program. He was told the goal was to help find a cure for schizophrenia, when in fact the goal was to research mind-controlled drugs for the CIA. For 18 months, Bulger and 18 other inmates, all of whom under false information had volunteered in return for reduced sentences, were given LSD and other drugs. None of the prisoners were informed of the truth about the experiment, that was in fact part of the CIA MK Ultra program. Prisoners were used in these experiments without knowledge of the real facts involved. Bolger later complained that he had been recruited by deception and were told they were helping to find a cure for schizophrenia. The facts were later confirmed as the documents of the CIA experiments emerged. He described his experience as nightmarish and said it took him, quote, to the depths of insanity. Notebooks Bulger wrote described the terror he felt at the thought of ingesting an 
additional dose of LSD. He wrote that he heard voices and feared that if he admitted this to anyone, he would be committed for life. In 1959, Bolger was briefly transferred to maximum security at Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary in California. Later in his sentence, he was transferred to Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary, and in 1963, to Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary. His third petition for parole in 1965 was granted after he had served nine years in prison. He would not be arrested again for 46 years. After his release, Bulger worked as a janitor and construction worker before becoming a bookmaker and loan shark under mobster Donald Killing, whose gang, the Killings, had dominated South Boston for over 20 years. The gang were, was led by three brothers, Donnie, Kenny, and Eddie, along with Billy O'Sullivan and Jack Curran. Their base was the Transit Cafe in South Boston, which later became Whitey's Triple Loaves. In 1971, the younger brother Kenny allegedly shot and mauled Michael Dwyer, a member of the rival Mullen Gang, during a brawl at the Transit Coffee. A gang war broke out, leading to a string of killings throughout Boston and the surrounding suburbs. The killings quickly found themselves outgunned and outmaneuvered by the younger Mullins. It was during the war that Bulger set out to commit what Weeks describes as his first murder of Mullen member Paul McGon McGon ah, excuse me, Paul McGonagall. However, Bulger instead ex executed his law-abiding brother Donald in a case of mistaken identity. According to former Mullen boss Pat, Patrick Nee, McGonagall ambushed and murdered O'Sullivan in the assumption he was the one responsible for his brother's killing. Bolger, realizing he was on the losing side, secretly approached Howie Winter, the leader of the Winter Hill Gang, and claimed he could end the war by murdering the leadership. Shortly thereafter, on March 13, 1972, Donald Killing was gunned down outside his home in the suburb of Framingham. Nee disputes this, claiming that Killing was murdered by Mullen enforcers James Mantville and Tommy King, not Whitey. Bolger and the Killings fled Boston, fearing they would be next. Nee arranged for the dispute to be mediated by Winter and Joseph Russo. In a sit-down at Chandler's nightclub in Boston South End, the Mullins were represented by Nee and King, and the Killings by Bulger. The two gangs joined forces with Winter as overall boss. Soon after, Donald's sole surviving brother, Kenny, was jogging in Boston City Point when Bulger called him over to a car and said, It's over. You're out of business. No more warnings. Kenny would later testify that Winter Hill enforcers Stephen Fleming and John Martorano were in the car with Bulger. After the 1972 truce, Bulger and the Mullins were in control of South Boston's criminal underworld. FBI Special Agent Dennis Condon noted in his log in September 1973 that Bulger and Nee had been heavily shaking down the neighborhood's bookmakers and loan sharks. Over the years that followed, Whitey began to remove opposition by persuading Winter to sanction the killings of those who stepped out on line. In a 2004 interview, Winter recalled that the highly intelligent Bulger could teach the devil tricks. During this era, Bulger's victims include Mullen veterans King and James Spike O'Toole. In 1979, Winter was arrested along with mem many members of his inner circle on charges of fixing horse races. Bulger and Flemmy were left out of the indictments. They stepped into the power vacuum and took over the leadership of the gang, transferring its headquarters to the Lancaster Street Garage in Boston's West End. In late August or early September 1974, Bulger and an accomplice reportedly set fire to an elementary school to intimidate U.S. District Court Judge Wendell Arthur Garrity Jr. over his mandated plan to desegregate schools in the city of Boston. One year later, on September 8, 1975, Bulger, an unidentified person, tossed a Molotov cocktail onto the JFK birthplace in Brooklyn, Brookline in retaliation for Senator Ted Kennedy's vocal support for Boston school desegregation. Bulger then used black spray paint to scrawl Bus Teddy on the sidewalk 
just outside of the National Historic Site. In 1971, the FBI approached Bolger and attempted to recruit him as an informant as part of their effort against the crime family. FBI Special Agent John Connolly was assigned to make the pitch. However, he failed to win Bolger's trust. Three years later, Bolger partnered with Fleming, an Italian mobster who had been an FBI informant since 1965. Although it is a documented fact that Bolger soon followed Fleming's example, exactly how and why continues to be debated. Connolly frequent, frequently boasted to his fellow agents about how he had recruited Bolger in a late night meeting at Wollaston Beach inside an FBI issued car. Connolly alleged, allegedly said that the FBI could help in Bolger's feud with underboss Gennaro Angelo. After listening to the pitch, Bolger is said to have responded, quote, All right, if they want to play checkers, we'll play chess. Fuck them. Wiggs considered it more likely that Fleming had betrayed Bolger to the FBI, given the choice to supply information to the Bureau or to return to prison. In 1997, shortly after the Boston Globe disclosed that Bolger and Fleming had been informants, Wiggs met with Connolly, who showed him a photocopy of Bolger's FBI informant file. In order to explain Bolger's and Fleming's status as informants, Connolly said the Mafia was going against Jimmy and Stevie, so Jimmy and Stevie went against them. In the 2011 interview, Fleming recalled, quote, me and Whitey gave the feds shit. They gave us gold. FBI agent John Morris was put in charge of the organized crime squad as the FBI's Boston field office in December 1977. Morris not only proved himself unable to rein in Connolly's protection of Bolger, but even began assisting him. By 1982, Morris was thoroughly compromised, having had Bolger buy plane tickets for his then-girlfriend, Debbie Noseworthy, to visit him in Georgia while he was being trained for drug investigations. Even after 1983, when Morris was transferred to head up the Boston Anti-Drug Task Force, he remained an accomplice to Connolly and Bolger. In the summer of 1983, the intensity of bad blood between the Winter Hill Gang and the Patriarcha family escalated to an all-time high. An employee for Coinomatic, a cash laundering vending machine company owned by the family, known only as Butch, was kidnapped while working. The police department, operating on a tip, raided a butcher shop in South Boston, co-owned by Bolger and two other Winter Hill members. Boston PD found Butch hanging from a beef rack, having been severely tortured and held for more than six days. The victim never testified, and all law enforcement documents were redacted of his full name. Law enforcement had hoped he would cooperate fully and then go into witness relocation. People familiar with Coinomatic and its sister company, Vienna Vending out of Fitchburg, Massachusetts, knew exactly who the worker was but the code of silence was still very strong in Boston. In the next few months, three low-level Winter Hill gang members were executed, mostly believed to be in retribution for the kidnapping of Butch. This bloody mob war shined a large spotlight on FBI agent John Morris and caused an internal investigation to begin within the FBI. In February 1979, federal prosecutors indicted numerous members of the Winter Hill Gang, including boss Howie Winter for fixing horse races. Bolger and Fleming were originally going to be a part of the indictment, but Connolly and Morris were able to persuade prosecutor Jeremiah O'Sullivan to drop the charges against them at the last minute. Bolger and Fleming were instead named as un unindicted co-conspirators. Bolger and Fleming then took over the remnants of the Winter Hill Gang and used their status as informants to eliminate competition. The in information they supplied to the FBI in subsequent years was responsible for the imprisonment of several of Bolger's associates, whom Bolger viewed as threats. However, the main victim of the relationship with the federal government was the Patriarcha family, which was based in Boston's North End, and in Federal Hill Province, Rhode Island. 
after the 1986 RICO indictment, uh, Angelo and his associates, the family's Boston operations were in shambles. Bulger and Fleming stepped into the ensuing vacuum to take control of organized crime in the Boston area. In 1980, Bulger was approached in Triple O's by Louis Latif, a Lebanese-American neighborhood bookmaker. Weeks, a bouncer at the bar, said he wasn't a big guy, maybe 5'7 and 185 pounds of Arab descent. He had a mustache like Saddam Hussein. That night, as always, he was talking in his obnoxious, loud voice. Even when there were 400 people in the bar, he always knew Louis was there. Latif had been stealing monies from his partners in the bookmaking operation and using the money to traffic cocaine and had not only refused to pay Bulger a cut of his profits, but committed two murders without Bulger's permission. Latif told an outraged Bulger he was also going to kill his partner, Joe the Barber, who he accused of stealing from a bookmaking operation. Bulger refused to sanction this, but Latif vowed to proceed. Bulger replied, quote, you stepped over the line. You're no longer just a bookmaker. Latif responded that as Bulger was his friend, he had nothing to worry about. Bulger coldly responded, we're not friends anymore, Louis. At this time, Weeks was about to get married, and shortly before the wedding, he informed Bulger that he was having difficulty finding a seat for Latif at the reception. Uh, Bulger said, don't worry about it. He probably won't show. Louie had always been a major moneymaker for Jimmy, and now he wanted to kill a friend of Jimmy. There was no way that would be allowed. Shortly after that, a week or so before my wedding, Louie was found stuffed into a garbage bag in the trunk of his car, which, would have, which was dumped in the south end. He had been stabbed with an ice pick and shot. He was color-coordinated. He was wearing green underwear and a green garbage bag. Before we move on, we'd like to remind you to hit that subscribe button, hit the bell notification button to be notified of future videos. And as always, if you want to support the show, you can buy us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash TCNS. Your support helps the channel grow, upgrade our equipment, bring in new hosts, be able to pay them. And as always, we thank you for your support, whether it's $1, $5, $20, $50, even $100. We appreciate any amount you give. Even the smallest amount helps us grow. In April 1994, a joint task force of the DEA, the Boston Police, and the Massachusetts State Police launched a probe of Bulger's illegal gambling operations. The FBI, by this time considered compromised, was not informed. After a number of bookmakers agreed to testify to having paid protection money to Bulger, Federal case was built against them under the Racketeering, Racketeer Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act, better known as RICO. Bulger had also set up safe deposit boxes containing cash, jewelry, and passports in locations across North America and Europe, including Florida, Oklahoma, Montreal, Dublin, London, Birmingham, and Venice. In 1994, he was informed by Connolly that sealed indictments had come from the DOJ and that the FBI was set to make arrests during the Christmas season. In response, Bulger fled Boston on December 23, 1994, accompanied by his common law wife, Teresa Stanley. After fleeing Boston, Bulger and Stanley spent four days over Christmas in Selden, New York, before spending New Year's Day in a hotel in New Orleans French Quarter. On January 5th, 1995, Bulger prepared to return to Boston, believing that had been a false alarm. That night, however, Fleming was arrested outside a Boston restaurant by the DEA. Boston police detective Michael Fleming, Stephen's brother, informed Weeks of the arrest. Weeks immediately passed the information on to Bulger, who altered his plans. Bulger and Stanley spent the next three weeks traveling to New York City, Los Angeles, and San Francisco before Stanley decided that she wanted to return to her children. They traveled to Clearwater, Florida, where Bulger retrieved his Tom Baxter identification from a safety deposit box. He then drove to Boston and drove, dropped off Stanley in a parking lot. Bulger met with Weeks at Malibu Beach in Dorchester, where Weeks brought Bulger's girlfriend, 
Catherine Grieg, Bolger and Grieg, that went on the run together. In his memoirs, Weeks described a clandestine meeting with Bolger and Grieg in Chicago. Bolger reminisced fondly about his time hiding out with a family in Louisiana. He told Weeks, who had replaced him as head of the Winter Hill Gang, quote, if anything comes down, put it on me, as they adjourned to, adjourned, excuse me, to a nearby Japanese restaurant. Bolger finally revealed how exhausted he was with a life on the run. He told Weeks, quote, every day out there is another day I beat them. Every good meal is a meal they can't take away from me. In mid-November 1995, Weeks and Bolger met for the last time at the lion statues at the front of the New York Public Library main branch and adjourned for dinner at a nearby restaurant. On November 17, 1999, Weeks was arrested by a combined force of the DEA and the Massachusetts State Police. Although by this time he was aware of Bolger's FBI deal, he was determined to remain faithful to the neighborhood code of silence. However, while awaiting trial in Rhode Island's Wyatt Federal Prison, Weeks was approached by a federal inmate, a made man who told him, kid, what are you doing? Are you going to take it up the ass for these guys? Remember, you can't rat on a rat. Those guys have been giving up everything, everyone, for 30 years. In the aftermath, Weeks decided to cut a deal with federal prosecutors and reveal where almost every penny, penny was stashed and everybody was buried. The first confirmed sighting of Bolger before his capture was in London in 2002. A businessman watching Hannibal recognized a photograph of Bolger in a scene featuring the website of the FBI's most wanted fugitives. However, there were unconfirmed sightings elsewhere. At one point, FBI agents were sent to Uruguay to investigate a lead. Other agents were set out to stake out the 60th anniversary celebrations of the Battle on Normandy as Bolger was reportedly an enthusiastic fan of military history. Later reports of a sighting in, April, in Italy in April 2007 proved false. Two people on video footage shot in Sicily, formerly thought to be Bolger and Grieg, walking in the streets of the city, were later identified as a tourist couple from Germany. In 2010, the FBI turned its focus to Victoria, British Columbia on Vancouver Island. In pursuit of Bolger, a known book lover, the FBI visited bookstores in the area, questioned at employees, and distributed wanted posters. Following his arrest, Bolger revealed that instead of being reclusive, he had in fact traveled frequently, with witnesses coming forward to say that he had seen him on the Santa Monica Pier and elsewhere in Southern California. A confirmed report by an off-duty Boston police officer after a San Diego screening of the departed also led to a search in Southern California that lasted, quote, a few weeks. And finally, after 16 years at large and 12 years on the FBI 10 most wanted fugitive list, Bolger was arrested in Santa Monica, California on June 22, 2011. He was 81 years old at the time of the arrest. Bolger was captured as a result of the work of the Bolger Fugitive Task Force, which consisted of FBI agents and a deputy U.S. Marshal. Bolger's companion during his years as a fugitive was his longtime girlfriend, Catherine Grieg. She grew up in Boston and had an identical twin sister, Margaret, and a younger brother, David. Their father was a machinist from Glasgow, Scotland, and their mother was from Canada, as was Bolger's father. At about age 20, Grieg married Robert Bobby McGon McGonagall, a Boston firefighter. He was from a family that led the Mullen Gang and was injured during a mob gunfight in 1969. Before his 1987 death by drug overdose, he reportedly held Bolger responsible for the murders of his brothers, twins Donald and Paul, who were killed in the fighting which occurred during the Mullen Killing Gang War. Catherine had been wanted by the FBI since 1999. The criminal complaint against her alleges that she harbored a fugitive, Whitey Bolger. After being captured alongside Bolger, she sought release on bail and home confinement, a request that was denied. She initially indicated that she would go to trial rather than accept a plea bargain. In March 2012, however, she pleaded guilty to a conspiracy to harbor a fugitive. A 
identity fraud and conspiracy to commit identity fraud. On June 12, 2012, she was sentenced to eight years in federal prison. She completed her sentence on July 23, 2020, and was later released from home confinement and electronic monitoring. She has been living quietly in South Boston with, his, with her twin sister, Margaret McCusker. On June 12, 2013, Bolger went on trial in South Boston's Joseph, John Joseph Moakley U.S. Courthouse before Judge Denise J. Casper on 32 counts of racketeering and firearms possession. <clears throat> the trial lasted two months and included the testimony of 72 witnesses. What or just maybe who killed Stephen Slippo Rakes? Investigators now reportedly believe that Rakes' body may have been dumped onto a road in a wealthy Boston suburb and that he didn't kill himself as first thought. What's baffling, he had no wallet or ID on him, but there were no visible signs of trauma, and the results of an autopsy that were just released are inconclusive. Rakes was eager to testify against former Boston mob boss James Whitey Bulger. He was very much looking forward to testify. Rakes was expected to say that 30 years ago, Bulger personally threatened his life to get him to turn over his South Boston liquor store to his alleged gang. 30 years ago, I'd never look at him. Now I can't wait to look him right in the eyes. And now his day has come. Earlier the day he disappeared, prosecutors had told Rakes he would not be called to testify after all. At Bulger's trial Friday, dramatic testimony from his former pal and partner, Stephen the Rifleman Flemmy. Flemmy recounted several murders that he says he committed with Bulger, including the shocking killing of Flemmy's girlfriend in his own home because they felt she knew too much. Flemmy, he said, I'll take it, I'll do it. He grabbed her around the neck and strangled her. Prosecutor, what did you do? Flemmy, nothing. I was in that courthouse and those were really chilling words to hear. One juror was crying as Flemmy actually in a very matter-of-fact tone, told that story. He also testified that Bulger plotted to kill two people to stop them from testifying at trials. Flemmy, by the way, is serving life for murder and racketeering, same kinds of charges that the Bulger are facing. And, and there's palpable tension in the courtroom between these two well, men. Well, these right? two, two guys do not like one another. At the end of the session on Thursday, they stood and stared and glared at one another uh, and mouthed, didn't say out loud, some rather uh, sharp expletives. The jury began deliberations August 6th, 6th, and then on August 12th, the jury convicted Bulger of 31 out of 32 counts in the indictment. On November 14th, 2013, Bulger was sentenced to two terms of life imprisonment plus five years. Casper told Bulger that such a sentence was necessary given his unfathomable crimes, some of which inflicted agonizing suffering on his victims. He was also ordered to forfeit $25.2 million and pay $19.5 million in restitution. Bolger was transferred from the Federal Tran uh, Transfer Center in Oklahoma City to U.S. Penitentiary in Hazleton in West Virginia on October 29, 2018. At 8.20 a.m. on October 30th, the 89-year-old Bolger was found dead. Bolger was in a wheelchair and had been beaten to death by multiple inmates armed with a sock wrapped padlock and a shiv. His eyes had nearly been gouged out and his tongue almost cut off. A law enforcement official described Bolger as unrecognizable. This happened to be the third homicide at the prison in a 40-day span. Bolger is buried at St. Joseph's Cemetery in the Boston neighborhood of West Roxbury under the Bolger family headstone inscribed with the names of his parents. On August 18th, 2022, three men were indicted in connection with the beating death of Bolger. Fotios Geese, Paul J. Colgaro, and Sean McKinnon. So before we go, let us know your thoughts on the case of Whitey Bolger. And like most people bring up during his time in prison and his murder in prison, uh, do you think there's uh, something fishy going on with his murder in prison? Do you think it was a setup by possibly the uh, law enforcement and perhaps uh, mobsters within prison that 
or ratted out by Bulger, let us know in the comments section below. As always, subscribe to our podcast, all major podcast platforms, including Good Pods. Check out Good Pods today. If you like social media, like Facebook and Twitter and pro, uh, programs like that, then you want to check out Good Pods. Good Pods is a combination of social media and podcasting. You can go on to Good Pods and find uh, your favorite podcasts, such as True Crime Never Sleeps, and leave comments on there about the episodes, as well as leaving us reviews and more. So check it out today on Good Pods. And as always, if you want to support the show, you can buy us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash TCNS. Your support helps the channel grow, upgrade our equipment, bring in new hosts, pay them, pay our writers, and bring in money to help us grow and possibly hire an editor to edit our content. And any support helps, whether it's a dollar, five dollars, fifty dollars, a hundred dollars, any amount is appreciated. Check the link in the description or go to buymeacoffee.com slash TCNS. And as always, thank you so much for watching and listening, and we will see you next time.